Last time we focused more on the fundamentals of downsizing, kind of why do it, what are the benefits, and then we talked about some resources and we shared some personal experiences and asked questions. So this week we're focusing on the tactical side of downsizing, trying to give you some very practical tips today so that you can walk out of here today, so to speak, or <laughs> click leave meeting and that you'll have some action steps that you can implement right away. That's my goal. And then next week, at the same time, we're gonna focus on emotional roadblocks to downsizing. And then the Wednesday after that, our very own Devin Lee, our host here today, is going to give us a tour of the tiny house that she's moving into on May 8th. So she is gonna talk about what it's like to be on the other side of the downsizing process. So we're really excited for that, Devin, and for the tour of your house and to be able to ask you tons of questions about your experience going through this process. All right, let's dive in. So I, here's just kind of a roadmap of where we're headed for this. Um, we're gonna talk about six different steps. The first one is to identify what your big rocks are, and we'll talk about that if you're not familiar with big rocks. To, and, and the second step is to envision the outcome. Third step is to make a plan, and then el enlist allies, make it so, a la Jean-Luc Picard from Star Trek and then let it go so you can grow. Those are our six steps on our path today. So for Bill and Harold, you were here last time, so I'm sorry, this is one of the few slides that is, is a repeat, but I feel like it's so important because it's our foundation. And that those are identifying our big rocks. Like This is what's going to ground us. This is where we need to start from. So is anybody familiar with the parable by Stephen Covey about the big rocks? Would anybody like to describe it? I will if no one else wants to. <laughs> Go for it. Um, the story that I remember is, um, well, the story I was told is a teacher is in front of the class and he has a jar. And um, he starts by pouring a bunch of sand in and then a bunch of petals and then a bunch of big rocks and none of it really fits. So then he reverses the order and he puts his big rocks in first and then the pebbles and then the sand. And he finds that because the sand and pebbles kind of find their way around the big rocks that everything can fit just right if you do it in that order. Thank you. That's a really great way to tell that story. I appreciate that, Deb. Thank you. So you, here's a picture that I'm sharing with you about what my big rocks are, what's important to me, and what I try to fill myself up with first. And I have a blank uh, worksheet on my website, and I'm happy to email it to you afterwards if it might be helpful to you or your loved ones so that you can draw out what your own big rocks are. So once we know what is most important to us, it helps us to gain clarity, set goals, and to make decisions moving forward. So it, it grounds us, literally. So before we, sorry, before we go on to step two, does anybody have any questions about big rocks? Or does anybody want to share what their big rocks are? We've got a shy group today and that's okay. <laughs> okay, so after you have your big rocks, the second step is to envision your outcome. So this is the rope bridge. And this is something that I've learned in my coaching training. This exercise is designed by um, a man named Cameron Gott, who's one of my coaching trainers. And so envision all of us on this side of the rope bridge today. We can't really see what's on the other side of this bridge. And for a lot of people, downsizing feels like this. Maybe we're having to downsize or right size because of a major medical diagnosis. Maybe we have had some falls. Maybe we've had a serious life change. Maybe we've lost a spouse or a loved one. Or maybe it's a good change. Maybe we've had a baby or we've added to our family. Maybe we've gotten married. And we just, we're in this period of transition and we don't know what things are gonna look like on the other side. And there's this huge gully underneath 
this bridge that feels scary and uncertain. It's all of the unknowns. So oftentimes we can feel paralyzed because we don't know what's in that gap and we don't know how to get across that bridge or what's gonna be waiting for us on the other side. So the more that we can do to envision our ideal outcome of what it's gonna look like on that other side, then we can fill in those steps, fill in those gaps or get resources or reach out to friends and people who have the tools to help us get there. But the more we can envision it, the clearer that vision will become and it'll become easier to make decisions about what to keep and what to let go of. Anybody have any questions or anything that they wanna share related to maybe an uncertain journey that I think we're all on right now at this point in time? <laughs> okay. So the third thing then, after we have our big rocks, we have a vision, then we're gonna make a plan. And you can do this in several ways, but I just, I urge you to keep it simple. Keep it to one page or less. Or if you're a visual person, you can use what's demonstrated here in this photo, and that is the Kanban method, it's K-A-N-B-A-N, where you put tasks on sticky notes. And you have three categories on the wall or on a board. You've got to do, doing, and done. So you could break up the chunks of whatever project you're working on, it might not even be downsizing, it could be any project whatsoever, you put the task in the smallest step possible, one per sticky note, and then you put them in the appropriate category. So for example, in your to-do list, you have different things broken up. If you have friends or family or people who are willing to help you with your right-sizing or downsizing process, that's really great because you can go to your board or your wall or wherever you're keeping your sticky notes and pull something off. And I could say, hey, Bill, I think this task will take 10 minutes. Can you please call this charity for me and find out what their criteria and their hours are so that I can drop off some donations? So th that's an example for a plan. Um, what else do we want in our plan? Let's write our vision at the top so that can ground us. You know, how will your new space look? How will it feel? How will it function? What items do you need to take with you to support that vision? What items don't support your new vision? Do you have a timeline? Like maybe your lease is up at the end of the year and so that's your timeline. Or maybe you need to sell your home by a certain time. Or perhaps you're moving into a new community that's being built and your apartment will be ready on a certain date. What's your budget? Good question to know the answer to. Um, what tools and knowledge do you already have access to? Take stock because you probably know more than you think you know. And then where are the gaps? Identify what else you need to know. What questions do you have? What skills do you need to gain? Or what, what resources do you need to learn about? And write all of those things down. But again, it doesn't have to be a huge endeavor. You can just keep it to one page. It can be on a cocktail napkin. Napkin, that's okay. <laughs> Any questions about making a plan? Okay. Yeah. All right. So the next step is you want to choose your friends for your journey. So imagine we're in the Wizard of Oz and we're setting out on that yellow brick road. Well, Dorothy didn't do it alone. She had some friends. And I'm trying to imagine which character each of you would be right now. No, but seriously, um, you wanna choose friends, family, and professionals who are most importantly, non-judgmental, respectful, and compassionate. This is your journey. So it's not about them, it's about you. And oftentimes, Unfortunately, people have really good intentions, but they will impose their own wishes and their own baggage and their own trauma on you through this process. They might try to force you to let go of things that you're not ready to let go of or that are meaningful to you. And so really try to surround yourself with people who are supportive without trying to influence you or lead you in a certain direction. Bill says thumbs up. <laughs> so
So if needed, one idea that comes from a book called Buried in Treasures is to create guidelines and to create a contract with the people who are helping you. That might sound like overkill and it might sound um, like a lot of work, but it's just really nice to have really clear boundaries with people before you embark on this journey if they want to help you. Because oftentimes in our line of work as professional organizers, we come across family members who really have the best of intentions. Um, but there's so much strife and conflict around trying to force somebody to let go of things that it really can permanently damage family relationships. So sometimes it's best not to work with family, even though their help might be free or friends as well. It might be worthwhile to invest in the help of a professional, or maybe there are other people who you trust who can help you, maybe members of your church or another community that you belong to. It could be neighbors, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, college students. There's a wide range of people who are out there to help. Another thing that's really important is that you should make all of the final decisions. You should never feel bullied into letting anything go. You know, even if I want to keep my empty wine bottle, this maybe this is really sentimental to me. Maybe this is from my wedding day and my spouse has died and this, this means the world to me. Then it's my decision. I get to keep it. Another helpful thing is to find an accountability buddy. Find someone who's also going through this downsizing or right-sizing journey, and you can be a resource to each other. Hold each other accountable. Say, these are my goals for this week, and touch base every week, and check in and see what you've accomplished. You know, report back. Talk about maybe where you ran into some roadblocks, and you can strategize or share ideas or tips that you've learned. That can be a fun way to help keep the momentum going, because sometimes this can be quite a lengthy process depending on how much stuff we have. And we know that the average American home has over 300,000 items. So that's a lot. And some of us have been in our homes for many decades. Um, another important point, just to kind of go back to our first point is to choose people who lift you up, who encourage you and who make you feel good when you're with them. All right. So here are some practical things that your allies can help you with. They can look up the donation criteria for your favorite charities. They can do the transporting for you perhaps, because sometimes that's the hardest part is, is the letting go and physically getting the items out of the house even after they've been sorted. Um, they can help you make a list of your donations for your tax purposes. They can ask you questions to help you make good decisions. And they can remind you of your vision, maybe when you get lost in the weeds of sorting through your 300,000 items. They can contact consignment shops for you. They can vet service providers or maybe be there with you when you meet with potential service providers. Maybe you're getting several quotes uh, for hauling, for example. So those are just a few ways that your allies can help you. Any questions about allies? Okay, so the next step a la Jean-Luc Picard. I don't know if anybody used to watch Star Trek Next Generation, but he would always say, make it so. So here we get into the nitty gritty and the tools and some of our favorite tools as professional organizers are the simplest tools. They are the colored dot stickers, Sharpie pens or a permanent marker, sticky notes, blue painter's tape, old boxes and trash bags. We keep it really simple. So those are the, the tricks of the trade. Now the secret is out. So here are some, some practical tips for getting started. You want to group like items together. So for example, clothing, let's say you wanna put all your socks together so you can see what you have or your jeans or your books or maybe your sporting equipment. And then you wanna have boxes or dedicated spaces for you to be able to sort. So you're gonna have categories like keep, donate, shred, recycle, trash, sell, and relocate. And I'm happy to share these slides with you afterwards so you don't have to frantically write. So I should have said that at the beginning, I apologize for those who are taking notes. But for some of us too, just writing things down helps us process information. 
that's how I process as well. And then you want to break your project down into small manageable chunks. You're probably not doing your whole house in one day unless you're calling in the whole Big Rocks team and we're going to do your garage all at once or something like that. Um, just take it one drawer, one cupboard, one closet at a time. Set really small achievable goals. Kind of that baby step formula. So here are some other tips that I find helpful and that clients have said have been helpful as well. Um, focus on what to keep. So focus on the positive, what's gonna support you in your vision rather than what you're letting go of. So that's where those colored dots come in handy is you can run around the house and for example, put a green sticker on anything that's going with you. Maybe a yellow sticker for things you're not sure about, maybe you need to do some more thinking about and red for anything that's not coming with you into the new phase of your life. Also, there may be some things that you're not quite ready to let go of up front, and that's okay. You could do kind of a halfway house exercise where you box the items up and you put a detailed list of the contents on the side of the box, and then you stick it in the garage or in a closet for a certain amount of time. It can be 30 days, three months, six months, whatever you feel comfortable with. But if you have not gone looking for an item in that box in that amount of time, then donate the contents of that box without opening it again. And make sure to put a note on your calendar so that you remember the box is in the closet because sometimes we might forget even that we put it in there, even if it's only been 30 days. I mean, I've done that myself. Life gets busy or maybe you have pandemic brain like I do and it's, you have trouble remembering things these days. So there's also a 2020 rule that might be helpful. And this comes from the minimalist. If you can replace something in under 20 minutes for under $20, and this was pre-pandemic timing here going to the store, but let's say you spend less than 20 minutes on Amazon and it's less than $20, consider letting it go. Don't hold on to it just in case, because if you're holding on to all of these items just in case, that could be a lot of items. And are they really serving you? So we'll have some more questions here coming up that you can ask yourself. One other tip is to make it fun. Blast some music, set a timer, and see how much you can get done in a certain amount of time. Really challenge yourself. Like, can I identify uh, 20 items in five minutes that I can let go of, for example? You can also do this with a friend. You know, pour yourself a glass of wine and have a Zoom or a FaceTime call or connect via Skype, and you can declutter and downsize together at the same time. So whatever you can do to just, to just make it fun. Okay, any questions about the, the first tactical tips? Okay, Bill's eyes are wide. <laughs> so here's some questions that you could consider asking yourself and these are practical questions. Next time we'll talk about emotional questions. So one is, is it useful and is it beautiful to you? This comes from William Morris's idea that we should have nothing that's not beautiful or useful in our homes. Is it a duplicate or maybe a triplicate? Or maybe you have 10 of something. It's surprising once you group things together, how many you'll find that you have of a certain item. If you keep it, will you remember that you have it? Do you have room for it? in your new space that you're envisioning? How will you display it or store it or use it in your new space? Do you need it? Do you just want it? Or really is the answer neither? How long do you need to keep it? This might pertain to some legal documents or papers. When can you let go of it? So I keep having uh, moving our pictures back and forth here so I can progress the slides. Uh, more practical questions. Is it too worn or broken or unidentifiable? Is the information still current? Will you actually use it or refer to it? When's the last time you used this item? When do you think you'll use it again or for the first time? And what circumstances have to be in place in order for you to use it? Can it be easily duplicated or recreated if you need it again?
I think a really strong concept and something that I come back to over and over again is I'll ask myself, is this adding value to my life or to my business right now? Is it adding value? And what is the worst thing that can happen if you toss this item? Will you really need it? If so, when? And a lot of us have unfinished projects, myself included. Are you really going to finish this quilt or this other project? When are you going to do so? I think right now is a good time to test that question in particular, because if right now a lot of us do have extra time on our hands and if we're not getting to these projects, if they're not a priority, if we haven't completed them, when we're able to leave our homes again, maybe that's a good criteria or measuring stick for letting a project go. All right, and just some quick questions about clothing. There is the X factor. If you ran into an X, would you be embarrassed by what you're wearing? <laughs> that is the X factor. That's from Gretchen Rubin. She's the author of The Happiness Project and other books. Do you feel great in it? Does it fit well? Does it match anything you currently own? How many do you have of them? So this is where that grouping comes in handy again. How many white t-shirts do you have? Or black slacks? How many do you need? Is this a high value item or is it really important? Or is this just getting in the way of you being able to find what you need in your closet when you need it? And how many people have heard of Project 333? Okay. This is a fashion challenge by a minimalist named Courtney Carver. Her website is called Be More With Less. And she actually, I think her book is just coming out, but she's been doing this for about 10 years now. And the idea is to have 33 items in your wardrobe that you wear for three months. So hence the 333. And so it's, it's what she calls a capsule wardrobe. And so basically all of the items usually will mix and match and you can wear with each other. And the 33 items includes accessories. It doesn't include, I think, underwear, socks, things you wear to the gym, but you know, you actually have to wear them to work out, not just for like lounging around your house, for example, or perhaps attending Zoom meetings. <clears throat> um, so if you want, you can check out her website, Be More With Less, and there's all the details on how to get started and how to do it. Um, I did do it for three months and it was really eye-opening. And I thought, okay, people are gonna get tired of me wearing these same outfits, but you can mix and match in so many different ways that, and oftentimes I think we're so concerned about our own appearance that we're not really paying attention to what other people are wearing. So you can often get by with just 33 things. So it's a really fun and easy challenge if you wanna give it a try. Okay, here are some excuses that might sound familiar. I might need it someday. I don't know what to keep. Usually people ask this in regards to paperwork. It was a gift. It reminds me of college, my mom, my sweetheart. I paid a lot of money for it and I don't have time to downsize. So let's talk about each of these just really briefly. Um, I might need it someday. This might sound harsh, but please show me where someday is on your calendar. Where is it? Yeah, what are we waiting for? What are we holding on to this item for? Does it fall under that 2020 rule? Can we let it go? Can you borrow it from somebody? And then I don't know what to keep. Well, then let's, let's do some research and find out the answers. You know, what are the guidelines for keeping paperwork? Can we look that up on the IRS website? Or can we ask our accountant or a bookkeeper? Or could we ask our professional organizer that question? It was a gift. This one can be tough, but sometimes we'll have multiple gifts from the same person. And I encourage clients to keep the top two or three things, their favorite things that that person gave them and honor those as treasures, you know, rather than maybe the 50 things. Or 
sometimes people are given a gift and they're afraid that somebody's going to come into their home and realize that that gift isn't there and they're going to ask them well where is this that I gave you for your wedding in 1954 I literally had a gentleman I spoke with on Monday and he said his mother had kept a vase that she thought was very ugly and someone had given it to her for her wedding in 1954 and she and her husband were married for I think 40 years before he passed and she hadn't seen those guests since the wedding in 1954. So there's very little chance that they're ever going to know that she let go of this vase, but she was still really struggling with that. So that could definitely be a, a real roadblock and we'll talk about those next week. Um, it reminds me of so-and-so. Just know that your memories live in your heart and in your mind. They're not in that physical object. So can we take a picture of that item, for example, instead? And then we can take a look at that picture and it will trigger those memories for us. That might be a lot easier than keeping a, a bulky physical item. Um, I paid a lot of money for it. Yes, you may have paid a lot of money for it um, back in the day, but what is it worth now? What is it worth to you for the amount of space that it's keeping in your home or taking in your home? What does it cost you to insure it or take care of it or heat it or cool it? Just to worry about it, just to know that that clutter is there weighing you down. What does that cost you? And then I don't have time to downsize. I think we can all agree that this might not be the best time to be able to make that excuse. So <laughs> does anybody have questions about tactical tips or excuses? All right, so the last step is once you've sorted through everything in your home, it's letting it go so you can grow. And here's a quote that I found today that I found inspiring is that difficult roads lead to beautiful destinations. So now we'll just talk about a few practical resources for letting things go. Um, well, when the stay at home order lifts and then I'm happy to take questions. So with letting things go, you've got basically three options. You can, you know, donate things to charity, you can trash or recycle them, or you can try to sell them. So we have donate, discard, and dollars. So here are just a few of my favorite local resources. If you're outside of the Portland metro area, I'm sorry, but I'm happy to help you find some resources closer to you. Um, one favorite resource is the Cedar Mill Community Library it has a second edition re resale shop. They take clothing and household items and artwork. And then there's also Community Warehouse and they take furniture and household goods. Um, prior to doing what I'm doing now, I was a victim advocate for about 15 years and I worked with victims of crime, primarily with survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault and stalking. And so in one position that I held, I worked with survivors of domestic violence who were coming out of emergency shelter, sorry, emergency shelter, and they were going into transitional housing. And so Community Warehouse partners with local nonprofits that serve domestic violence survivors. And then the caseworker, which is what I was at the time, and the survivor go, they make an appointment and they go to the warehouse. And then they, they essentially go shopping for furniture and goods to furnish that survivor's new apartment. And oftentimes these were women with children and they're moving into small apartments and it was a clean slate. They didn't have anything to take with them. Um, also they support people who lost their homes to fires or other natural disasters. So it's locally based out of Tualatin and it's, it's a really great charity to support. There's also Habitat for Humanity. And a lot of people don't know that they also take household goods, like they'll take dishes, they will take paint that's half full or more, and they recycle it and make other paint that people can buy that's really affordable. They take house plants. They'll take, if you dig up plants out of your yard and put them in a pot, they will take those as well. So they're a really cool resource. And after this whole pandemic subsides, I'm hoping that they'll do in-home pickup again because for just $20, they will come to your house with a 24 foot long truck and two movers 
and they'll, you know, they'll take as much as will fit in their truck for just a $20 fee to cover their gas and labor. You can't beat that. And Community Warehouse will do that also. They have a slightly higher fee of $50, but they're primarily taking, you know, furniture and pretty big heavy items. And we also have the Rosehaven Women's and Children's Day Shelter located in Northwest Portland, and they serve over 200 women and children a day who are experiencing homelessness and they're able to come in for a hot meal and they get to pick out two new outfits and almost all of from my understanding is almost all of the people who are accessing Rosehaven services they are working but we know that housing prices in Portland are outrageous and a lot of folks can't afford somewhere stable to live so Rosehaven is a really great source they take um items like small rolling suitcases, um, backpacks. They will take costume jewelry, purses, clothing that's in good condition. And they'll take supplies for pets too. And then the Beaverton School District, a lot of folks don't know that Beaverton has the highest ratio of um, homeless and students who are precariously housed um, of any school district in our state. So they have a clothing closet and then they also accept household goods and furniture as well. Um, so discarding, sorry, I don't mean to get lost in the weeds here, but I get really passionate talking about resources. So for recycling, we have um, Gemtex. They'll take clothing and textiles, and these bins are usually located throughout town. You'll see them. Oftentimes, they're bright green, and usually an Arco gas station will have one in the parking lot. They might be closed off right now, but um, when things open up again, you can just drive by anytime, 24 hours a day and put things in the bin. And they're able to reuse 98% of the things that are donated to them. Then we have Metro. We're really lucky to be able to recycle a lot of hazardous waste and chemicals and other items like broken Christmas lights, tires, paints, solvents, things like that. Um, we have Goodwill that does free e-waste recycling, and there's also Free Geek. And then Agilix, if you have any number six styrofoam or plastic, or all of the plastic utensils and silverware that we have a tendency to collect, um, those can be dropped off 24 seven. It's just right across the street from Washington Square Mall. And they have these big dumpsters that you put your styrofoam in and it's open 24 hours a day and it's free. And they melt it down and they make it into jet fuel. So it's really cool that we have that resource here because not a lot of communities are able to recycle styrofoam. If you wanna to try to make some money from your things, here are some consignment resources and, and resources to sell items like the Assistance League of Greater Portland. They do a lot of wonderful work in our community. Um, they support children, foster children by giving them two outfits that they can wear to school. They get to pick them out themselves. They also provide clothing for survivors of sexual assault to wear home from the hospital after the forensic exam. So a lot of people don't know that their clothing is taken into evidence and then they have nothing to wear home. And so they're able to go home with dignity with the clothing that's provided through Assistance League. So those are just two of the things they do. They also support other programs in our community. Um, there's OfferUp where you can list items yourself and they can be free or you can charge a fee. eBay, of course, Facebook Marketplace, and then other consignment shops that we have locally are Consignment Northwest. And then we have the Brooklyn Mall, which is in Southeast. And they focus more on antiques and the Consignment Northwest has more of a contemporary feel and flair. And Consignment Northwest also does jewelry, but not costume jewelry, real jewelry. Um, estate sale options. If you feel like you have between six and $8,000 uh, worth of stuff, and if you have room for about 70 cars to be parked inside or outside your house and around your neighborhood, an estate sale might be a good option for you. And I'm happy to put you in touch with a very reputable company that does estate sales. Um, if you don't have quite enough value or you don't have parking to do an estate sale, you could look at doing an estate sale buyout where someone comes into your home and they take a look around at your items and they make you an offer right then and there and then they'll clear out your house, essentially. You don't typically get as much as you would for an estate sale, but it's also, I guess, maybe less hassle, less work. 
And then there's also a clean out. And that's something that we do at Big Rocks is if perhaps someone has passed away or maybe their items don't have a lot of value, um, a clean out can be a really good option where everything is sorted and donated where possible. And then we do recycling and send things to the landfill only when needed. Okay. Thank you for listening, everybody. Really appreciate you being here. Does anybody have questions? I have a question, Whitney. Um, first of all, well, thank you for that whole presentation. Your dedication to making sure things are donated to the appropriate places and donate and like recycling them and um, it's super inspiring to me that you go the extra mile. So I always appreciate that about you. Um, but my question was, I was wondering if you could talk more about, um, well, I, yeah, I guess you might cover this next week, but um, when you get really, really stuck and you're feeling overwhelmed, like how do you, um, how do you go about um, getting an accountability partner in the first place? Because I know that you have one and it's not necessarily someone that you knew already, right? Yeah, that's a great question. So I've had my accountability partner since December of 2018. She's a fellow organizer whom I met through NAPO, which is the National Association of Productivity and Organizing Professionals. And she's in another state, she's on the East Coast. So we're not competitors, we're not in the same market, but we've each been in business about the same amount of time, about five years. So we're kind of on a, at a similar level in our businesses and really serious about wanting to grow. So what she did was she put out a message on our listserv, which is called Point, and there's about 4,000 organizers worldwide. And she said, I'm looking for an accountability partner. And then she had a laundry list of about, I'd say 25 questions that she asked. And so that was the first filter was, you know, who was willing to fill out this questionnaire and send it back. And I think maybe 10 people did, and I was one of those 10. And then she set up a phone interview. So we talked for 30 minutes and she asked some more questions and I got to ask her questions. And, and then we had a second phone interview. So, I mean, this was like more serious than most people take dating. I feel <laughs> it's, but it's turned out to be a wonderful experience. So we ended up selecting each other. And what we do is, so every Monday morning, we send each other a list of our goals for the week. And then on Fridays, we talk for 30 to 60 minutes. And then so she has half the time and I have half the time. And it's based on confidentiality. Everything is utterly confidential that's discussed. And so I think that that's the premise of trust that you need to have in an accountability partner. So we can ask about anything or I can tell her that I've encountered this difficult situation with a client. Can you help me brainstorm some possible solutions or approaches? to working with this person, for example, um, or, you know, it, or I'm, I'm stuck here with my goal, or maybe you know, everything's gone sideways with this pandemic. What does the future look like? So we talk about everything from business and then of course, personal influences your business as well. So it's just been such a help to have her as an accountability partner. We've seen each other through a lot of really hard times like her mom has passed we've had a lot of changes going on in our lives but we know that we have each other and we know that we have 100 percent confidence in our confidentiality and it's just so wonderful to have that safe space and have that person who is your cheerleader who maybe when you're getting up and you're just not feeling really psyched or encouraged you're feeling kind of down that day like you're just going through sludge trying to move forward with your business and that person is there to help lift you up and keep you motivated and help you keep going. So 